What's up, Mortgage Coach community? I am pumped on this conversation because it's just, it's vision casting for the mortgage space. We're calling this the Josh Metal Mortgage Manifesto. Uh, it's anchored in this modern mortgage summit. So the night before the summit, I wrote up this manifesto that was going to be the opening thoughts. And for anyone that hasn't listened to this series, I'm creating a series of these interviews of keynote speakers from the Modern Mortgage Summit. So it's and it's it's called Mortgage Manifesto. So check it out. You want to hear what Denise Donahue's Mortgage Manifesto is? It's right there. Uh, so so Josh, I did Dan Keller last week, and I Man. did um, God, who did I just do? No Wally. pressure. Wally, I did Wally. Yeah. It's Wally, a, Dan, Denise, you know, like no pressure, Josh. <laughs> right, right. I love so, it. So first of all, what did you, you, you listened to that opening. You obviously heard your own keynote, but you heard some others. You know, what did you think of the, the manifesto? Well, the, the manifesto, I think, summarizes really what everybody was saying in, in different ways with their own slant. But I think you did an incredible job writing up the manifesto. I just, you know, so everybody knows, I... I kind of took it as like, you know, the, the Bible here. I, 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 I wrote down my notes. I highlighted the sections that really, really strongly resonated with me. And uh, I'm excited to dive into it with you today and, and see, see what juice we can squeeze out of this. Yeah, well, I, I, let's do that. And then let's also try to have the goal where you could take this conversation and write up your own manifesto. Uh, so now you're still leading a team doing production building a company, you know, tell us a little bit about your team's production and what you're doing right now in today's market. Super proud of our team, you know, coming off of last year, that was exhausting. You know, it was really a difficult year and there's plenty of challenges. Um, and, and coming into this year, obviously we had a, a company change and that, that always saps the energy out of you, but our team is doing an, just an incredible job. We'll, we'll probably finish the year right around, um, right about 15 to 1600 families served um you know that'll be roughly 600 million in volume for 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 my production team and our los our 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 front end team our back end team they are just working their butts off and this is a changing market right so they in the middle of that they've they've really shifted from this focus on restructuring past clients debts which will never go away but that was the vast majority of their business back into this uber competitive purchase market so having a great time running the team and they're they're rocking it so i want to make sure people call out that he when he said he didn't say refis you know we stopped doing refis he you know just called it restructuring families debts because they don't do refis they they you know josh always looks at the whole picture as a liability advisor, and then comes up with ideas and strategies to restructure debt, not do refis, right? That, that was an interesting catch. I didn't even realize I said that, but we, we really have um, created kind of an internal dialogue that is so familiar to us. And we, we talk a lot about doing you know, global debt analysis. Like, I just think it's a crime if we're going to look at refinancing somebody and put them through that process and incur all those expenses, appraisals and closing costs and what have you, like we need to look at what's the global uh, benefit and, and overall best strategy for, for restructuring their, their global debt. So that's something that everybody should you know, be thinking about every single time is how do we set this person on a different financial trajectory? Yeah, no, total, totally agree. Well, let's, let's unpack our manifesto a little bit. And what I would love to do is I'm not asking you to read it out loud, but I am asking you to like, what were some things that really resonated with you? And then I am sure there are some things that aren't in that document that when you're telling your manifesto, there might be some stats that you call out. There might be some strategies that you call out. Let's, let's just kind of do a, a version one of the Josh metal manifesto. I'm going to read the highlighted sections that resonated the most with me, and then I'll, I'll kind of dive into my notes, and I think that'll accomplish what you're looking for. Um, so the, the section, the first thing that really jumped out at me is, you know, we should be competing with CPAs, financial advisors, realtors to deliver the best advice and experience and the best financial literacy education they've ever received. And as I, as, I, as I think about kind of like the problem or the challenge in the mortgage industry right now, I see the mortgage industry essentially broken up into three different buckets, if you will. On one side, we have 
uh, lending tree on my uh, stock, uh, every stock app that I go in or every article I read on my phone, pitching a 1.88% 15 year fixed. And by the way, that comes with, you know, probably two or three points. And that's just the prescription that that they're going to um, that they're going to prescribe to everybody because it's the lowest possible rate. That's like the click button get mortgage strategy, at low price on this bucket. And the the middle the other side of the spectrum is the super is exactly what you described here. This is ad, advice advice from a mortgage professional like they were a financial advisor with a holistic group a holistic view of that person's financial situation with the viewpoint of how does this transaction impact this family 15, 20, 30 years down the road. So you've got the price, you've got the advice. These are the two buckets on the opposite end of the spectrum. And then you've got everybody else in the middle, that middle bucket, and they really don't have the lowest rate and they really haven't learned how to give great advice. And I think it's that middle bucket of originator that is mostly susceptible to disruption going forward. I mean, we're all susceptible, but there's no moat around this middle bucket in terms of protecting their business and market share. Well, they're, you know, I'm not going to do the doom day like you're dead and you're going to be out of the mortgage business. By the way, maybe you will be, but you will not win. Like there is a race going on. There are people that are helping families create generational wealth and there are mortgage professionals creating generational wealth. And the ones that are winning the race are, they have this mindset that I'm not just a loan officer getting a family to say yes to, you know, when I ask, what's your social security number? And they say, yes, that's not winning. That's, that's just giving me everything I need to do my analysis and discovery. And, and now we're presenting strategies to help families accomplish bigger things. So I love that. And, and it sounds like you prescribed you. Do you believe, like I believe, that that the mortgage experience could truly be more financially valuable than all the advisors that we kind of called out in that manifesto? For sure. So I'm going to answer that question by by reading the next part of this manifesto that I highlighted. You said, but there's a financial literacy crisis in America. And I wrote next to that equals opportunity. And the, the reality is people don't understand leverage. People... Um, incorrectly in most cases assume that the lowest interest rate and a 15 year mortgage is the fastest way to wealth. And nine times out of 10, that isn't true for that family because they don't have a financial uh, liquidity fund. They don't have anything, but maybe just the basic amount that they're investing in a 401k. And those 401ks are probably misallocated with super high fees and aren't going to be what they hope they're going to be in retirement. And so unless we've taken a, a, a holistic view of where they're at and help them understand that, look, you, you have no, no liquidity outside of your home and your goal at, with this 15 year loan is to simply put more equity or more wealth into your home, but you're not diversified, you're not growing. And why would we wanna pay off a, a 2% mortgage or a 3% mortgage when the S&P historical average over the last 100 years is a 9.8% return. Why wouldn't we want to diversify into something that can grow and compound instead of on a mortgage? So I think in that discussion, Dave, there is an opportunity to ask deeper questions, open-ended questions. Like, you know, when, when I was talking to a, a client the other day and I just said, hey, Dave, what, is your, what, is your, what does retirement look like for you? How do you envision your life in retirement? And, and that open-ended question gets them to start to think and realize, I haven't thought this through well enough and I, I need some help. And so asking open-ended questions and then going deeper and helping them uh, understand a financial plan is the opportunity that we have as modern mortgage professionals. Love, love that. Any, anything else you wanna call out in the, the manifesto? I do, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you put these stats in here that there's 16.5 trillion in mortgage debt in America and 19.4 trillion in equity. Um, the stat that isn't in here that I, uh, I recently looked up is that there's an additional roughly 4 trillion. I may be a little high or a little low, but there's another, you know, 4 trillion in non-mortgage debt. This is unsecured debts, student loans, credit cards, car loans, all those kinds of things. And I think that's the opportunity, Dave. The opportunity is 
we've been given this incredible blessing with, with home appreciation levels. In Utah last year, the average home appreciated at 23%. That is a blessing of blessings. And this year, we're probably going to be up another 15 to 20%. I mean, it's incredible. So if, the, if we have $4 trillion worth of non-mortgage debt in the United States, we have the opportunity to help those clients restructure not only their mortgage, but their global debts, create cash flow into their budgets, and of course, invest that cash flow. And every time I do a, a mortgage coach analysis and I show, hey, here's if you're refi, here's if you're refi and you take your savings and you re reinvest it in your mortgage, here's if you refi into a 15 year, and then here's if you refit, I take those savings and invest it at a, at a, at a six, seven, eight percent return over 30 years. A hundred percent of the time, the client is more wealthy by taking those savings, paying off debt, taking the cash flow and redirecting it towards investments. But that's not what clients think. Clients think that the, uh, the, the lowest interest rate and the shortest uh, amortization is the path to wealth. And so we have to, we have to re, um, we have to re, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We have to re-educate those clients on what the actual fastest path to wealth is. So I want to pull up a couple slides and I want to play off of what you just said, Josh. Uh, and by the way, I, I may have misheard what you said, but when I, at least the numbers I have found when it comes to total liabilities, including mortgage, it's 34.5 trillion. So, okay. so, and, and, and guys, one of the ones that is, is just a huge missed opportunity for most mortgage professionals is, is this student loan issue. Like I did not know before I started really nerding out on this, that there's 45 million people that have student loans. Like guys, there's only 49 million people that have mortgages to fund homes. So, so almost as many people that have mortgages and homes in America have student loans. And I absolutely didn't know that 27 million of those are eligible for either a reduction or forgiveness, like right now. So, so guys, there's a huge opportunity as a mortgage professional um, in what Josh just said in that concept of, of really managing all a family's liabilities and, and optimizing all liabilities for one purchase power because remember, purchase power isn't just buying a home. A home is the fastest and the best vehicle for wealth. So it's 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 helping people optimize how they create wealth with real estate. Um, go ahead. And right now, a fixed rate 30-year loan is arguably more valuable than it has been in the last 20 or 30 years. So let me explain to you why. We have this unique moment in time. I can't remember another time like this. So Dave, help me out um, if, if, if you challenge me here. But right now, you know, we have uh, core inflation. The CPI for August was 5.27%. Well, stop for a minute and help people understand what that means. What that means is that the value of their dollar is only worth 94 and a half cents because inflation is eroding the value of that dollar. Now, if you have a bunch of dollars in a bank account, that's bad. You need to get those somewhere where they can beat inflation or at least keep up with inflation. But Dave, if you have debt, inflation works the opposite way because you're borrowing money at a fixed cost, call it 3% interest for 30 years. But the value of those dollars is going down. So you get to essentially pay back today's debt at a fixed cost with tomorrow and 10 year and 20 year and 30 years from now dollars that is less valuable. And that's inflation induced debt destruction. You know, Jason Hartman um, that you introduced me to uh, helped me name that, that, that effect. But, you know, take a look at the quick numbers here. If you have 5.27% CPI inflation numbers, and a three and a quarter, let's just say 30 year fixed, that means you're actually ahead 2.02% to borrow that money because the value of the debt is being devalued 2.02% faster than the interest rate that you have on that 30 year loan. 
So now more than ever, does it make sense to say, okay, I don't have enough money invested that is keeping up with inflation. I can take the cash, the equity out of my house. I can use that to pay off these student loans and all these other high payments. I can take that cash flow and now start directing it into something that's going to beat inflation. And then I'm going to lock in this 30 year debt at three and a quarter, knowing that my 2025, my 2030 dollars, I'm going to have wage growth by then. I'm going to have higher wages and be able to pay back the same debt with a higher income. Um, I was just looking at numbers in my county, in Utah County, wage growth in the last 12 months, Dave, is 7.4%. So if my wages are going up 7.4% per year, that means the impact in my budget in terms of what it feels like to make that mortgage payment, it gets easier and easier every year because my income goes up, but the payment and the cost of that credit stays the same. So, so guys, this is where, if you can't explain that as well as Josh did, I'll bet you there's some new loan officers that just heard all that and they still don't really get a grip for what he said. But, but guys, if you can be that mortgage professional that understands what he said, teach what he said, you're going to kill it. And here's the deal. You're not only going to kill it with families and you're going to leave them better off, but you're going to have more referral partners. So Josh, tell me if you agree with me, uh, this whole manifesto and this captain of the wealth team, the loan officers that believe this and that can achieve this are going to be very attractive partners to financial planners, to CPAs, to real estate agents. Like you're going to become a very hot commodity and, and guys, and big online lenders, like when Josh said, hey, there's three parts of the market, low cost, you know, big data online providers, you will win against those guys if you think like this. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that and, and the idea of putting more priority around CPAs, financial planners, and all those advisors? Yeah, I think that CPAs and financial advisors are experts in their wheelhouse, but very rarely are they experts across multiple disciplines. So in other words, uh, a financial advisor is dang good at the asset side of the, of the balance sheet. Usually not as adept in advising people on the liability side of the balance sheet. And I, when, whenever you have an interest rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage or a 15-year fixed mortgage that is below the rate of inflation, that, that liability becomes an asset because the rate of inflation is greater than the interest rate. And so the value of the debt is essentially being reduced each year due to inflation. When we can start to talk to financial advisors and explain that to them and tell them how we're positioning the mortgage as an actual asset because it's fixed for 30 years and the value of the debt is going down, not just by payments, but by inflation. And then we can show them because of that, more than ever, it makes sense. And especially with the equity we've had over the last couple of years, the equity buildup, it makes sense to pay off all the rest of these debts and get more dollars in our investment accounts. Here's the other thing. If we think that there's going to be more inflation in the years ahead, and by the way, if you're the federal government and you owe the number of trillions of dollars of, of national debt that we owe, you want inflation too. Because as the biggest debtor in the world, the US government benefits by inflation because the value of that debt is decreasing while the tax revenue is going up. So you want to play the same game that the US government is playing, which is fix those interest rates for as long as possible extract as much cash, get it in other investments that are going to grow faster than the rate of inflation, and let the debt simply be destroyed by the power of inflation. And Dave, I did a, I did a podcast with Jason Hartman where we spent an hour talking about inflation-induced in, uh, debt destruction. If you're willing, I'll give you a link for it, and you can, you, know, you can put it in the chat afterwards. So I would love for you to put it in the chat of our Facebook group. Um, and I'll give it to me and I'll get it in LinkedIn. So, or excuse me, in uh, YouTube. So guys, if you're watching the recording this in YouTube, there'll be a link down below to that podcast. I would also love to get, just think of a total cost analysis that you've done where you deliver this kind of advice. And let's just have a Josh Metal sample of a um, debt reorganization or restructuring 
strategy. And, and guys, we have, you know, we're moving into a purchase market, but with all of the misallocated liabilities out there in America, most consumers don't have the right mortgage. They don't have the right mix of other debts. So I would urge you, you know, like we got to lean into this purchase market. But when you're doing an annual review for a client, when you're doing a quarterly review, you got to look at the whole picture and you need to you need to deliver a total cost analysis. So, Josh, let's go into wrap up mode. Is there anything else that's like super important you want to make sure you call out for the manifesto or something that it's going to be in your version that you want to make sure it gets called out? Yeah, I, I think I would just like to kind of like wrap up with like like action items. If you're hearing this and you're saying, I'm with you, but how do I turn this theoretical idea that Josh just talked about into practical applications with clients? So let me leave you with three steps. And I was thinking about this, um, you know, how, how did I make the switch? And how did I get from, you know, when I was just introduced to a total cost analysis with Dave, 10 years ago, probably now, uh, to, to where we are today. And really, there was just three real steps. So, so step one is write down three or four open-ended questions for, for clients that get them to contemplate their plans for retirement. And it can be as simple as the script that I landed earlier on, you know, Dave, tell me how you envision or imagine uh, your retirement going in terms of your finances. And, and when you ask an open-ended question like that, first of all, they've never heard that from a mortgage advisor before. That, you know, they're like, huh? And they're going to realize that they have not put enough thought into it and they're going to start to get scared is what, is what typically happens. They're like, crap, this is an area that I, I need to put some attention. I just don't know where to start. So that opens up that conversation. The next step is- Come on, Come on. I want to throw one more question, guys. And if you're watching this and you've got like, hey, here's one of the questions I get to get people thinking in the future, put it in comments down below, but also just asking people, how old do you want to be when your home is paid off and free and clear and you're debt free? And, and some people will have some Dave Ramsey, you know, in 10 years as fast as I can. And some people will have some kind of Rick Edelman, you know what, I don't care if I ever pay off my mortgage, I want to have enough money to pay it off. And then most people will be in between. And then you can bring leadership because here's the deal where people want to be and where they're actually going. There's always a five to 10 year gap. Well, really a five to 20 year gap. So, so find out that gap from where they want versus what they have and then jump into it. So sorry, I just wanted to insert that. That was great. So the open-ended question gets them into contemplation mode and frames up that you're a different kind of advisor and that you may have something valuable to offer. The, the, then that should be followed by a series of close end questions. Like Dave said, at what age do you wanna be debt free? Or where, do you, where would you be comfortable with your income in retirement? Great, how much of that's social security? How much of that's uh, um, uh, your 401k? How, what's the gap? Like starting to get tactical with some of those questions. For, for younger first time home buyers or, or, or people with young kids, just simple questions about, you know, ha have you covered all the bases with insurance? Do you have license insurance, disability insurance? Have you thought through what would happen? God forbid, if, you know, if you, if you were to not be on this earth anymore, Dave. So those kind of questions is, is number one. We have to start asking better questions to understand the holistic financial situation for our clients. The second thing is we have to become comfortable being the challenger salesperson. And Dave and I've talked about this book probably 50 times in videos. If you haven't read it, you know, do so. Um, get, get the Cliff Notes version. But essentially, it is the courage to step into somebody's life and to say, I know you want a 1.88% interest rate. I get it. I love low interest rates too. But the reality is that isn't the fastest path to wealth. And I'd be out of integrity with myself if I didn't, you know, call a timeout and see what else might be true in terms of investigating other mortgage strategies. Would you allow me to show you a couple of strategies I think can build you and your family more wealth? Like that's the, that's the mentality we need to start taking and then looking at their debts and saying, this isn't about the interest rate of the loan. This is about cash flow. My job is to show you how to create the most amount of cash flow in your budget and then help you figure out where to point that so you can create the greatest amount of wealth. So that was step two. A real, real quick. Guys, the book he was referencing is called The Challenger Sale. So Google it, 
read it, the Challenger Sale, amazing sales book. And I, if you, you missed it, he gave you really good scripting. So, I mean, put pause, re-listen to that. He gave you some really good finesse scripting where he empathized with the client, I get it, boom. And then he repositioned it with the client and he did it in a way that no cool human being would not follow him. So anybody that wouldn't follow that transition that Josh had, you know, they're probably not your customer guys, but make sure you really listen to that closely. And I think, I think as important as the scripting is the energy that the words travel on. When, when I am trying to challenge somebody's assumption, I'm really doing it from, from love. I'm really doing it from care. I'm really hoping that they will allow me an opportunity to show them what else might be true. In other words, their assumption is lowest rate and shortest amortization is the fastest path to wealth. Well, all I'm trying to get them to open up is to say, maybe there's another faster path to wealth that I'm unaware of, and I'm willing to allow you to teach me. And so if you're energetically communicating and that that's the the energy level that your communication comes with, regardless of what you say, I think you're going to win. I think you're going to be successful. Great leadership. Number three. Number three. And number one and number two aren't worth crap if you don't do number three. And this is the one that I am still working on, really working on getting better at. But when the loan is closed, we have to make sure that they actually do, do with the money that we created in their budget what they said they were going to do with their budget. In other words, if I just do a TCA and I just show them that they have $400 a month redirected towards an investment account at 7% over 30 years is going to make them another a million dollars and they don't actually do that, then what was the point? The point was I just used the piece of content and the cool graphs so that I could get another commission. So we have to get past that point and do a post follow-up call where we check in with them and say, all right, do you have a plan? Do you have a financial advisor? Are you using Wealthfront? What are you using to put those dollars into an investment vehicle that's going to outpace inflation? We already talked about how important that was and that is going to get you to what I created in that analysis. And if they don't, then it's our job to grab the hand of a financial advisor and the hand of the client and put the two hands together and say, this is what I built. I fi we figured out together a path to create another million dollars in your life let's make sure it actually happens. Let's make sure it wasn't just a cool idea. So I think that's the, the, the step that I have missed just to be vulnerable and honest. I haven't done as good a job of that. And that's the step that I'm, you know, recommitting to make sure that I don't miss going forward. So let me insert a thought, see if you align with it and we'll wrap this up. I mean, I think, you know, one and two totally agree, get it. I think number three is deliver the total cost analysis and have a great advice experience. I think you take that for granted because you do that. You've done it thousands of times, but most loan officers listen to this. And even there's a lot of loan officers that will do some discovery. They'll ask some great questions, but they'll never document it in a way that nets it out. And so number three, guys, if you're not doing this, total cost analysis, make sure the client gets it, they understand it. But I mean, to your point, I'm going to call it, it's my number four. Okay, I'll number take three, it. My number four. And, and you make a really good point. And it's why I named the name of the company Mortgage Coach. Like when I founded Mortgage Coach, I owned MortgagePlanner.com and I owned MortgageCoach.com. And, and I, it took me a month when it was naming the name Mortgage Coach. And I, you know, and, and I thought Mortgage Planner would be more intuitively obvious. It, people would like it. But I thought to myself, all the most valuable people in my life, they helped me make good decisions. And then they helped hold me accountable to those decisions. Oh, and they wow. were coaches. They were coaches. And, and so like, that was my whole thing. It's like, if, it, if I just wanted to like have a TCA be at the point of sale and make a good decision, I would have called it mortgage planner, you know? And, but I wanted the vision for mortgage coach was we're going to help you make a great decision. And then we're going to remind you we're going to inspire you. We're going to stay on you so that that decision, you know, like we're going to, if you decided, Hey, I want to pay an extra hundred dollars versus, versus, um, you know, my payment and accelerate my debt reduction. Well, guys, 
you're going to get a TCA every month, every quarter, and we're going to remind you to implement that strategy. So anyways, Josh, I love that you called it out. I'm going to call it number four. Uh, any, any closing thoughts after kind of the back and forth that we've had? I love the idea around a mortgage coach not only giving perspective and challenging the assumption of the consumer, but being an accountability partner. And you know, one of the things that I'm I'm learning is so valuable from my um, time that I've been spending with Ryan Grant is the follow up campaign that he has with his client success managers, where they check in and there's a post closing call and there's a three month call and a six month call and there's a twelve month call and all those notes are in there that we made these agreements and here's what you were going to do. And now that client success manager steps back in and says, hey, Josh, just so you know, they're not doing what, what you guys agreed on. And we get a chance to have another conversation. So uh, I really like the accountability piece of that. And that, that kind of helped me up-level my thinking. So thank you. Yeah, and guys, anybody who's listening to this, I wanna, I'm gonna list a few resources it, to do that coaching after the fact. I mean, mortgage coach in an annual review is one of those. There's a lot of CRMs where you can, you can automate that Total Expert automates that. Uh, Jungo uh, automates that to where you're automating annual reviews. There's there's HomeBot, which is an amazing beyond the transaction. You make these promises to families, and now the, every month you're giving them a scorecard on how their mortgage and their real estate and their equity is performing. Uh, you know, there's the art of owner ownership, which is you know Ryan Grant's creation. Of, of not only taking Mortgage Coach and HomeBot and House Happy and other platforms, but then putting his brand around it and then texting it, emailing it, having resources. So I, I really wanna push everybody listening to this. What is your mortgage manifesto? Is it documented? Is it clear? And then how are you executing at the point of sale? Are you doing what Josh is saying? open-ended questions around retirement and financial freedom, closed-ended questions, delivering a TCA, holding people accountable. And then do you have the technology to implement that? Like do you have the CRM that you're using and it's doing this, you know, do you have mortgage coach? So those are my closing thoughts. One more time, Josh, for you, anything else? Yeah. I mean, we have the opportunity to change the world. We have more information about clients and families, consumer finances than any other financial service professional in the world. We, we know more than the financial advisors, more than the CPAs, more. With great, um, you know, with, 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 what's the word, out, that quote that is just escaping me. Uh, to whom much is given, sorry, I was just gone. To whom much is given, much is expected. And I just think with as much as we've been entrusted with, it's up to us to step into that light and change the, uh, to educate that family and to potentially change their financial freedom. And we can do it. We can, we can literally be the group of professionals that puts a dent in the universe and changes the world. So why not? That's a hell of a fun mission. Guys, we're, we're gonna do it. One more push I wanna put. I mean, it's clear that Josh has given leadership on how to serve the families. You call them leads, you call them referrals. How do you serve them? But I wanna push you guys to go further than that. I want to push you to, you know, when you do create social media content, make sure it's not all marketing, that there's education. And then I want to push you guys to volunteer at local colleges, volunteer at local high schools, and, and get out there and let's bring these messages, a rent versus own at a local college class, a, you know, power of money and home ownership to high school seniors. Let's, let's not only serve the people that pay us, Guys, let's let's serve young children and let's fix this fiscal, fiscal literacy crisis in America. The mortgage industry can do it. So, Josh, you the man, bro. Love it, brother. Appreciate Thanks, you, man. Dave. I hey, hope everybody got value. Give it a like, share it with your mortgage friends, and uh, look forward to seeing your mortgage manifesto. Take care, y'all.